Okay, that works. Hello. Hello. Is mine on? Is my microphone on? No, your voice is quiet. <laughs> Hello. Kill. God is sitting on his throne, anticipating another sinner will soon become his own. Years of wasted living and years of toil and strife are just about to be over as he receives a gift of life. Go sound the horn, strike up the choir, a sinner is saved, saved from the fire, no more in darkness, he's received my son, all heavens rejoices, that's the value of one. Spirit has been working to soften up their heart. All he needs is a willing servant who will simply do their part. Can you imagine up in heaven the joy that will be that day? As a sinner bows his head to pray, can't you hear the Father say, Go sound the horn, strike up the choir, a sinner is saved, saved from the fire, no more in darkness, he's received my son, all heavens rejoices, that's the value of one. Our construction on his mansion there on Hallelujah Street. He doesn't know yet what is waiting when the Savior he will meet. He'll meet. Go sound the horn, strike up the choir. A sinner is saved, saved from. No more in darkness, he's received my son, all heavens rejoices, that's the value of one, all heavens rejoices, that's the value of one. I just need, need to work on your choreography when you're getting up here to start with. Amen. All right. I'll let you guess who's preaching for us today. Let's look at it beginning in verse number 11. Titus chapter 2, verse 11, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. We could preach on that, couldn't we? So winning, not passing anybody up, not writing anybody off, not deciding for anybody whether or not they want to hear the gospel and be saved. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men. But that's not what we're preaching about. Look at verse 12. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world without preach, won't it? The grace of God doesn't teach us that now that we are saved by grace through faith that we can go out and sin and do anything we want and it's okay with God. The grace of God is not a license to sin. The grace of God teaches us that we're to deny ungodliness and worldly lust, 
And it's the grace of God that teaches us to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. But that's not what I'm preaching about. Look at verse 13. Looking for that blessed hope in the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Now that'll preach, won't it? And today would be a good day, wouldn't it? The Lord Jesus said, no man knows the day or the hour when the Son of Man cometh. But I pick every day, amen? And one of these days, I'm going to be right. I'm going to hit it right on the head, amen? I'm going to be right on the money. And today's going to be the day. That day will be the today that Jesus comes back. And I'm looking for that blessed hope. The blessed hope of the child of God is not that Trump gets reelected two years from now, even though that would be a good thing. Or that, you know, all the liberals and the communists and all the rest get swept out of office in the elections. That would be helpful, or that the economy gets back on track, or whatever else you can think of. The blessed hope of the believer is the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. But that's not what I'm preaching about either. So look at verse 14. Who gave himself. Now who's the who? That's our great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. I'm going to focus on that last statement in verse number 14, that peculiar people, zealous of good works. Let's bow our heads together, please. Heavenly Father, we pray that you'd help us now for these next few moments together as the word of God is opened and preached. Would you speak to our hearts today? Would you help us? In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You know, the word zealous means to be heated. It means to be compassionate. It means to be eager. And to be zealous is to keep the fire burning. It's to uh, keep the fires of compassion and eagerness burning in our hearts and burning in our minds and burning in our lives. And, you know, we just finished the student body revival just a couple of days ago. And we were excited during the student body revival. And we heard some great preaching. And every service, the altar was filled. And every service, God's people were making decisions uh, to get closer to the Lord and be more faithful to God and all these things. But from Friday till Tuesday, it looks like the fires kind of died out in some of you because the looks I'm getting right now are looks of boredom and looks of indifference and looks of, well, I hope I can stay awake in chapel this morning. And looks of what you have on your mind, what you're going to do after chapel and after classes today. And it seems to me like the fire that was kindled last week is already starting to die out a little bit. And there's the danger of that. The special meetings are over and now it's back to business as usual. And it's too easy to let complacency and uh, comfort start to set in again. It's too easy to begin to slip back into lukewarmness and half-hearted service, and it's too easy to go back to doing just the bare minimum in order to get by and keep up appearances. According to the verse we just read, Titus chapter 2 and verse number 14, we who are the redeemed, we who are the born-again children of God are to be a peculiar people zealous of good works, and not zealous just for a time, but zealous for a lifetime. Exodus chapter 3, I won't have you turn there, but you remember the story in Exodus chapter 3. Moses had been tending sheep in the backside of the desert for his father-in-law, Jethro of Midian, for about 40 years. And God appears to Moses out of a burning bush. And the bush caught Moses' attention because he noticed it was on fire, but it wasn't being consumed. It was burning, but it wasn't burning up. And I know that was a, a miraculous revelation of God of himself to Moses in that time it piqued Moses curiosity which is why he turned aside to see this great sight this bush that was burning and not consumed but I was thinking about it praying about it in the context of this message this morning and God gave me this thought you know you and I are to be just like the burning bush when it comes to our zeal for the Lord our zeal for, for God We've heard it said many times and again this past week that it's better to burn out than rust out. Well, I say it's better not to do either one. Why not just stay on fire for God and not burn up? Why not just get that zeal of the Lord, be zealous unto all good works and just determine we're going to keep burning, we're going to stay on fire for God, but we're never going to burn out. I met a pastor years ago, I'm sure he's with the Lord by now, because I met him in a, in a meeting about 30, maybe 34, 35 years ago. Uh, the church that the meeting was being held in 
there were several steps, several steep steps out in front of the, the front door of the church, and uh, this man was so elderly that he needed a man on either side to kind of get him by the arm and assist him going up all those steps. And even the little shuffle steps that he took, they had to help him. They had to assist him getting over the threshold once he was on the top of the porch there, the landing, just to get over the hump to get in the door of the church. And uh, I went over to ask to see if there was anything I could do for him. And uh, he just smiled and said he was fine, but he introduced himself. He said, my name is George Batch. And you've probably never met George Batch. You've probably never heard of George Batch. And again, he's probably been with the Lord for many years now. George Batch was 95 years old, and he still pastored his church in Akron, Ohio. He still preached three times a week. He still showed up and led his church in soul winning and visitation. He pastored his church at age 95. And uh, I would say there's the guy who was burning but was not consumed. And even at age 95... Uh, the zeal was still there. He was still being zealous of good works, even though he was pushing 100 years old. Uh, look at our pastor, Pastor Carter, um, who's 87 now. And he's been retired, and Pastor Parsons is closing in on his second year as our pastor. And thank God for Brother Parsons being a man after Pastor Carter's own heart, being a man after the Lord's own heart. But you can look at Pastor Carter and tell he didn't retire because he had to. And the zeal has not diminished and the fire has not gone out. These are examples of men who are zealous under good works and not just zealous for a time, but zealous for a lifetime. So what I want to preach to you about this morning for just a little while is this subject. Keep the fire burning. Keep the fire burning. One of the saddest statements I think I've ever heard from a fellow believer is when somebody says, you know, I used to be a soul winner. I worked in a warehouse in Poinciana for about a year when I was here as a student in Bible college. One of my fellow students moved down here, relocated from North Carolina to go to college at Landmark, but uh, he ended up working at the same place I did, and uh, it paid pretty good for back in the late 80s. I think it paid $6 and something an hour, amen, and minimum wage back then was about 3 bucks an hour, so that was not bad money for you know working part-time in the evenings like that to try to pay our way through college. But this guy got offered a promotion at the warehouse, and he dropped out of college to get paid a little bit more at the warehouse. Now, I worked at the warehouse for about a year, but I was only working to pay my way through college. And one evening on break, I was witnessing to one of the people, one of my fellow workers there in the warehouse, and I, behind me, I didn't turn around to see what was going on, but I kept hearing a forklift buzzing back and forth behind me in both directions every few minutes. And finally, after I'd done witnessing to my coworker, I turned around and it was my former classmate who had dropped out of college for that good paying job. And he was the one who'd been buzzing by on the forklift on his break. And he stopped and, and he said, you know, I used to do that. And I said, I know you used to do that. Why'd you ever quit? He dropped out of college. He dropped out of church because all of a sudden that promotion on that job was more important. The fire went out, folks. He didn't stay zealous of good works. One of the saddest things somebody can say to us is, well, I used to teach a Sunday school class. I used to work a bus route. I've met men whose lives look like they're just in total disarray and disaster, knocked on doors, soul winning, and have somebody tell me, I used to be a preacher. But what a heartbreaking testimony that is to hear something like that. You wonder what happened. It, why is that brother no longer faithful to church? Why is he or she no longer a Sunday school teacher? Why are they no longer bus workers or preachers or choir members or whatever it is that they used to do for the Lord? They don't do it anymore. And uh, sometimes there are legitimate reasons for people having to give the testimony that I used to do this or that. Uh, for one thing, the sad truth is if you live long enough, you're going to get old. And sometimes along with old age comes uh, physical limitations that you didn't have when you were younger. People that have the desire to get out and do it like they used to do it, but the truth is they just don't have the energy and the, the vigor and the physical ability to do it anymore. That's why Solomon said in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth. Don't ever use the excuse, I'm going to serve God when I get older. Because if you don't serve God while you're younger, you won't serve God when you get older. You will be just as sorry and lazy and worthless when you get old as you are now that you're young. 
If you get on fire for God now, you just keep the fire burning when you get older. And you just stay on fire for God. You remain someone who's zealous of good works. Uh, Ecclesiastes said, remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth while the evil days come now. You know what the evil days are Solomon's talking about? He's comparing old age to evil days. And in a lot of ways they are. Now I don't consider myself to be old quite yet. I am, I have been eligible for several years for all the senior discounts here in the state of Florida and I take advantage of every one, amen, but I still don't consider myself old. I'm still trying to convince my wife that she and I are middle-aged and she still is by the way, I'm just a little beyond that, but um, I'm not middle-aged anymore and there are mornings when I first roll out of bed and my back sounds like a bowl of Rice Krispies, it's snap, crackle, pop. And then I try to, try to straighten up, stand up straight, and it goes, and it just pops and cracks all the way up my spine. And think funny things happen when you start getting older, amen? And that's why Solomon referred to him as the evil days of old age, when what you would love to do and what you used to do, you just can't do anymore. That's why Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12, let no man despise thy youth. But he said, in your youth, while you're still young, be an example of the believer in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. How about being an example of the believer in your youth of faithfulness and of zeal and of a burden for the lost and of a zeal for God that you want to do that which is pleasing to the Lord. It's easy to see why so many older saints have to give the testimony, well, I used to, and it's not because they don't want to. It's just that they can't. But too many times I used to is just an admission that the fire's gone out. It's a confession that the compassion and the eagerness are gone. It means that they are no longer zealous of good works. There's a danger that's very present and re very real to all of us of allowing the fire to go out. You know, fires don't burn forever on their own. For a time when I was traveling playing music, I lived in, in a old, I don't know how old this house was, but it was old and leaky and drafty in Nebraska. Nebraska is flat, and in the wintertime, it is cold, and the wind blows at 20, 30 mile an hour wind chill wind would come whipping through that house almost as if the doors were wide open and there was no glass in the windows. And the only heat in old, that old house was a pot belly stove in the middle of the house in the kitchen. And before we go to bed on a cold winter night, we get that fire just blazing hot. Everything that stove could do or that whatever iron, whatever that stove material was, that would be almost glowing red hot and we'd go to bed that way. But a funny thing had happened about three or four in the morning. The fire would burn out. And pretty soon it's cold in that place and I'd wake up not only shivering and trying to find other blankets to get under because eventually somebody in the band got cold enough that they would get out of bed and go restoke the fire, but nobody wanted to be the guy that had to get out from under the covers and do it. So I just reach for more covers and more blankets, and then you see the icicles, the stalactites hanging from the ceiling and all that. It's time to get up and restoke the fire. And you know, in our Christian lives, that fire, that zeal is not going to burn forever on its own. It has to be rekindled. It has to be refueled. It has to be restoked. We have to keep deliberately keep the fire burning, or the fire is going to go out. In the book of Revelation, we find the Lord Jesus Christ rebuking a couple of his churches for allowing the fire to go out, allowing their zeal to be diminished. In Revelation chapter 2, verse 4, he's speaking to the church at Ephesus, and he lists all these wonderful things they were doing. He commended them for being a soul-winning church and being a separated church and being a scripturally sound church and, and being a spiritually discerning church and all these things. But then he says in verse number 4, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee. For thou hast left thy first love. You say, what does that mean? They left their first love. That means they were still doing what they were supposed to be doing. They hadn't quit running buses. They hadn't quit the soul winning program. They hadn't uh, abandoned the King James Bible. They hadn't gone off into worldliness. They were still doing right. They were still doing what they were supposed to be doing. But their heart wasn't in it anymore. They were just going through the motions. 
it was just all mechanical service to them. They just did right because it was just the right thing to do. They had left their first love. They had lost their emotion. They had lost their fire. They had lost their fervency. They had lost their zeal. They had lost their passion. You know, that may work for you for a while, but sooner or later, you and I are going to get tired of pretending. If you're ice cold on the inside, you can pretend like you're on fire for God on the outside, maybe for a little while. But sooner or later, the ice in your heart's going to manifest itself on the outside too. You've, you've lost your first love. You've left your first love. The fire's going out. To the church in Sardis, the Lord Jesus said this, I know thy works that thou hast a name that thou livest and art dead. In Sardis, they were even worse off than they were in Ephesus. Because at least in Ephesus, even though their hearts weren't right, even though the fire had gone out, they were still doing right. But in Sardis, they even quit doing right. Thou hast a name that thou livest, but you're dead. They had a reputation other churches that were aware of the church in Sardis still looked at that church as an example, as a role model. And boy, that's a soul winning church. That's, a, that's an on fire for God church. And the Lord Jesus said, you have a name that you live. Everybody thinks you're alive, but I know you're dead. I wonder how many of us in this room, the Lord Jesus could pin the name Sardis on us today. I know you have a name that you're alive, but I know you're dead. They were living in the past. They were leave, living, at least in the eyes of uh, observers, the eyes of the brethren, they were living on their past accomplishments and their past reputation. They used to go soul winning, but then the fire went out and nobody has a burden for the lost anymore. They used to run buses, but nobody has a passion for the bus ministry and the bus kids anymore. They used to have a Sunday night service and a Wednesday night service, but nobody is zealous for the house of God and the things of God anymore. You know, it's hard to have zeal when you're dead. It's hard to be zealous of good works when you're dead. So how can we keep the fire burning? How can we continue for a lifetime being zealous of good works? How can we build on what God began in our hearts, the fire that God kindled in our hearts last week, that revival that most of us experienced and when, when God touched us and got us back on the right track, how can we maintain that not only for the rest of the semester, not only for the rest of the college year, but for the rest of our lives or until Jesus comes? Three thoughts real quick. Number one, keep your eyes on the prize. Keep your eyes on the prize. Turn with me to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3, and look at it in verse number 13. Philippians chapter 3, verse number 13. Paul says, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Paul said this, after 30 years of serving God, after being such a, such a greatly used and successful missionary and soul winner and preacher and prayer warrior and church planter and all these things, there he is writing. He realized Philippians was written from a dungeon cell that the first time that Paul was brought out of that dungeon cell was on his way to the chopping block when he was beheaded. And even in that shape, Paul knows he's at the end of the road. He wrote to Timothy about this same time and said, I'm ready to be offered and the time of my departure is at hand. He knew his days were numbered, but he still wanted to continue pressing toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Paul said, I haven't arrived yet. Paul said, I haven't finished yet. Paul said, I'm not ready to quit and just coast to the finish line yet. I want to remain zealous of good works. I want to keep the fire burning. So I keep my eyes on the prize. He said, this one thing I do. You say, what is the prize that Paul was pressing toward? What is the high calling of God in Christ Jesus? It's to hear the Lord Jesus call your name one day and say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. That's the prize. Keep your eyes on the prize. Keep, keep your eyes on what it's all about anyway. That'll keep the fire burning. If the only reason you go soul winning is because on a regular basis, God enables you to be there when somebody gets saved, what are you going to do when you hit a dry spell and you go weeks or maybe months and nobody gets saved? 
you're going to let the fire go out. You're going to quit. You're going to get discouraged. It just doesn't work anymore. You know, not only have a lot of in individual Christians decided that soul winning doesn't work anymore, whole churches have decided that soul winning doesn't work anymore. And when you go, you folks in the singing groups, you go to visit that church or, uh, you know, somebody like myself or maybe one of you guys gets invited to go preach at that church. They have about a half a dozen people, the average age being 85 years old and up, and they haven't reached anybody in years and years. And as soon as the last of those 85 and 90 year olds die, dry up and die off, there won't be a church there anymore. It's because the fire went out. The zeal has diminished. The zeal has died. They weren't faithful to be zealous of good works. You say, what is the prize? The prize is to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. The prize is to be rewarded at the judgment seat of Christ with a crown of life for a lifetime of faithfulness. The Lord Jesus said in Revelation chapter 2, verse 10, be thou faithful unto death and I will give thee a crown of life. Now, I've heard that preached more than once, that that's the martyr's crown, faithful unto death. And certainly that applies to the martyrs. That would apply to William Tyndale, who was burned at the stake for translating the Bible, and the other Christians down through the ages that were beheaded and fed to the lions and tigers and bears and the wild beasts to be ripped apart, ripped to shreds in front of the cheering crowds and those that were tied off on either end of wild horses that were galloped off in either direction and pulled the Christian apart like a wishbone and those that were sewed up into burlap sacks full of rocks and poisonous snakes and thrown off of bridges to sink to the bottom of the river and either die of the poison or die of drowning one or the other in just awful ways and certainly all those are heroes in heaven now and they're saints that receive that crown of life but you know, you don't have to be a martyr to be faithful unto death. Just be faithful till you die. If you and I die at age 100 in perfect peace and sound mind and sound body and good health and we just go to sleep one night in our bed and we wake up the next morning in the presence of Jesus in heaven, just be faithful till that time comes. There's a crown waiting on the other side for those who are faithful unto death. There's an incorruptible crown the Bible talks about for not only running God's race, but running to win. The idea is not just to finish. It's not just to drag yourself across the finish line. The idea is to win the race. There's a crown for those who live the victorious Christian life. There's a crown of rejoicing. For leading precious souls to Christ, leading precious souls to find salvation. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse number 19, Paul writing back to these converts that he'd won to Christ in the city of Thessalonica and gathered them together and, and left the church behind where he'd won these people. And he writes back to those saints of God in Thessalonica and he says, For what is our hope? What is our joy? What is our crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? You know what was Paul's crown of rejoicing? Saying that's the soul winner's crown. That's what Paul had to look forward to when he met Jesus for being faithful to the task and keeping the fire burning and keeping a zeal and a burden for the lost and winning souls right to the end. And he was going to have a crown of rejoicing to look forward to. And you and I can win that soul winner's crown. That's the prize. That's the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. A crown of righteousness for living close enough to God that you're excited about is coming back. I know believers that don't get excited when somebody preaches on the Lord coming back. I know some believers that get kind of depressed and discouraged when you preach too much about the rapture could happen any moment now because they're not close enough to God where it excites them. They're so attached to this world and the things of this world, they don't want to leave this behind. I'm excited that Jesus could come today. But you know what? Back Now, I wasn't saved when I was most of your age, but back when I was I'm looking around for, we don't have any students in this room old enough to, that I can say I was excited when I was your age because I wasn't even saved when I was your age. <laughs> Amen. But from the time I got saved in my 20s, I was just as excited about the possibility that the Lord could come back any day as I am now. And back then, when I heard preaching on the rapture could happen any day, I joined in with John from the Isle of Patmos and said, Even so, come, Lord Jesus, today could be the day. Amen. And Paul says there's a crown of righteousness that Paul said is not just laid up for him, but, but for all them also that love his appearing. 
if you're close to God, you'll be excited about his promise to come back for you to take you home to be with him. What happens if we don't keep our eyes on the prize? What happens if we lose our zeal? What happens if we lose that fire, if we lose that compassion? What if we aren't faithful unto death? What if we don't run uh, not only to finish the race but to win the race? What if we allow ourselves to get to the place where everything regarding our service to God is what we used to do? Well, the Bible tells us that if we allow those things to happen, we can lose the crowns that we would have been given. Wouldn't it be an awful thing to serve God so faithfully for so many years and have that well done, now good and faithful servant to look forward to and think about being recognized, being honored with those crowns at the judgment seat of Christ. And folks, we know, we've read the Bible, those crowns aren't for bragging rights. We don't even get to keep them. They're for casting at Jesus' feet because he's worthy of those crowns. But what about if you're standing there and while the rest of us are casting maybe one crown we've been given or two or three or four crowns that we've been given for our faithfulness and our soul winning and our zeal and our love for the Lord? What if we're busy casting our crowns and you've just got to kind of try to hide in the back of the crowd because you don't have any crowns to cast? And when the Lord Jesus called so many of our names and rewarded us with well done now good and faithful servant you notice he didn't say that when he called your name that can happen folks the bible says that can happen revelation chapter 3 verse 11 the lord jesus addressed the church in philadelphia and concerning their faithfulness and he said this behold i come quickly hold fast that which thou hast in other words he said keep doing what you're doing don't let up don't let go don't quit hold fast that which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. You know, God uses men, but so does the devil. And you notice the Lord Jesus warned about no man taking our crown. Because God can put the right people, well, according to the devil, the right people, the wrong people in our lives to get us sidetracked. To get us away from where we ought to be or get, up, get us going in a different direction than when we should be headed for the Lord. And the next thing you know, once again, we've lost that fire. We've lost that zeal. We've lost that compassion. I was reading just this morning something popped up on the internet about a, a brother that for many, many years was a fireball, independent, fundamental Baptist preacher. And now he's gone the liberal direction he uses ungodly music in his church using the world's music doesn't wear a suit and tie when he preaches anymore took the name baptist off of his church sign has nothing but unkind things to say about independent fundamental baptist even though he was one for decades i think some man must have influenced it certainly wasn't the holy spirit of god that influenced him to make all those changes in the wrong direction in his life and in his ministry. I think he started listening to the wrong man. And he allowed some man to steal his crown. What a shame to stand before the Lord Jesus one day with no crowns to cast at his feet. When if you just would have kept on doing what you were doing, you would have had crowns to cast at his feet. But you just let the fire die, you let the zeal die, you let the compassion die, and some man took your crown. How can we keep the fire burning, number one? Keep your eyes on the prize. Number two, keep your eyes on the place. Keep your eyes on the place. How can you keep the zeal and the passion for the Lord alive in your own heart? Well, do what Colossians chapter 3 and verse 2 says. Set your affections on things above and not on things on the earth. Folks, we're here only for a little while. And I know you're just young people now and you think you have your whole lives ahead of you and short of Jesus coming back, I hope you do. But it goes awful quickly. You know, the Bible tells us in Psalm 90 that, uh, you know, man's days, the, the days of his years amount to about 70 years. The Bible says three score and 10 and sometimes 80. Not everybody gets to stay that long and many people get to stay longer than that. To a young person living to be 70 or 80 years old seems like a long time, but I challenge you, you talk to a 70 or an 80 year old and they'll tell you just how fast it went. 
It's going to come and go so fast. I see young families in our church with little kids now. And it's like yesterday, my kids were little kids. Now one of them's 26 and one of them's 22. I turned around and snapped my fingers and they went from little toddlers running up and down the aisles in the church. I saw one kid one time, he was running down the aisle and he had one shoe and sock on and the other foot, all he had was a sock. And somebody looked at him and said, poor kid, he must have lost a shoe. And I said, either that or he found one, amen. But either way, he was, miss he was missing his shoe. And I thought, you know, I remember when my son was doing the same thing at two or three years old, terrorizing everybody at church and running up and down the aisles. Amen. And he's 26 years old now. It happens fast, folks. I'm just telling you. God says your life is a vapor that appeareth for a little while and then vanisheth away. And all of us that have been living for any length of time certainly can testify to that. So don't get so wrapped up in this world that you can't see past it because uh, keep your eyes on the place, that place called heaven. That's our eternal home. That's our forever home. That's the place where you and I are going to be in, in the house of the Lord forever. Our earthly time is short and our earthly possessions are temporary. Now, I don't care how wealthy you get. I don't how, care how much you can buy and possess and own and hoard and everything else store up and all you can do uh, the Apostle Paul sets us straight on that in 1 Timothy 6, 7. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. I don't care how rich you get. When you die, you're going to leave every dollar behind. It makes no sense at all for a child of God to lose his zeal, to lose his fire, to lose his compassion for God and for the things of God and go chasing after the things of this world. Because in the end, you just leave them all behind anyway. King David had the right attitude there at the end of Psalm 23. He said, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That's what David was living for, not the things he could glean in this world, not the things that he could pile up in this world and hoard and, and uh, bring to himself his possessions in this world. He was looking forward to living in the house of the Lord forever. Paul said this, we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle, talking about our earthly bodies, our earthly lives were dissolved, we have a building of God and house not made with hands, talking about our glorified bodies eternal in the heavens. When I get to heaven, I won't have a receiving hairline anymore. I won't have bifocals anymore. I won't have my wife pestering me that I need to go out and get hearing aids anymore. Amen. I tell her when I don't hear her, that's on purpose, amen. That's called selective hearing, and most wives accuse their husbands of having that anyway, but we'll need that. No hearing aids, no canes, no walkers, no wheelchairs, no doctor's offices, no sick beds. One day we're going to trade in this 70 or 80 years or whatever God gives us on this earth for eternity in the Father's house in the presence of Almighty God. The Apostle Paul told us that when we die, we can't take it with us, but the Lord Jesus said while we're living, we can send it on ahead. Didn't he say, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where thieves do not break through and steal, where moths do not corrupt? And he said, lay not up for yourselves treasures on this earth because the thieves will steal it from you when you turn your back. And if you keep it in the closet long enough, the moths will get it, amen? It'll rust away, it'll fade away, whatever it happens to be. How can we keep the fire burning? How can we keep our compassion and our zeal for the Lord alive? Keep your eyes on the place called heaven. Live every day with eternity in view. Realize this isn't your home. Thank God this isn't your home. This world is a mess. This world is nuts. This, folks, young people, you don't know because you haven't been around long enough. Ask anybody in this room with a little bit of gray up on top, and we can all plainly testify this is not the America we grew up in. This is a hollow shell of the America that used to be. The Supreme Court of the United States a little over 100 years ago recognized in a unanimous decision America is a Christian nation. You know what we are now? We're a pagan nation, a heathen nation that barely tolerates Christians. I'm glad this world is not my home. I'm glad God promised me something better than this. 
Because if this is all there is, I'm going to be awful disappointed. Amen. Last thought real quickly. Time's almost gone. Not only keep your eyes on the prize, not only keep your eyes on the place, but keep your eyes on the person. The prize is the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. The place is heaven. The person is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 2 says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. Keep your eyes focused on Jesus. It's the Lord Jesus Christ we're living for, not ourselves. It's the Lord we're to live to please, not to please ourselves. It's his honor and glory we should be seeking and not our own. Now, if there's a biblical example of someone who maintained his zeal to, for the Lord right to the bitter end, who kept the fire burning in his heart from the beginning of his Christian life to the end of his Christian life, I would venture to say that's the Apostle Paul. In the last chapter of the last book of the Bible that God used him to write, 2 Timothy chapter 4, Paul said this, For I am ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. The day Paul is talking about is the day he would stand before the Lord and receive that reward. And he said, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Now, you look back at the record that we have in the word of God of Paul's Christian life. And Paul's Christian life was not all uh, pink lace clouds and chocolate drops, was it? I don't even like chocolate drops or pink lace crowds. So I'm glad the Christian life is not that way, amen. But Paul's life was not all blessings and happy times and good times. Paul had been threatened and he'd been beaten and he'd been arrested and he'd been stoned and he'd been threatened with death and shipwrecked and abandoned and betrayed and robbed and all these things. Numerous times we find the Apostle Paul, uh, somebody out to get him, somebody out to take his life, threats made on his life and attempts on his life. He spoke of being in weariness and painfulness and hunger and thirst and cold and nakedness and and finally, he's sent to Rome, where under house arrest, he was awaiting his execution by being beheaded. And this same Paul had written to the saints in Rome and encouraged them with these words, For I reckon that the sufferings of this world are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. I'm not, I'm not living for what I can get out of this life. I'm living for what God has for me in the next one. Amen. Not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. In writing to the saints in Philippi from his prison cell, he wrote, To depart, speaking of dying, leaving this world and this life, he said, To depart and to be with Christ is far better. Now, you and I don't always look at death as far better than life. And I'm not going to be the next one to volunteer to die. Amen. But when God says my time is up, I'm not going to be upset with God about that. I'm going to heaven, folks. I'm in a win-win situation, amen? Just like Paul, for to me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. Now, we're a little bit afraid of dying because we've never done it before. It's kind of scary to us, isn't it? But God's not afraid of our death. God says precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Short of the rapture, that is God's means of reclaiming his children, called them out of this world and home to heaven. What's so bad about that? If my death is precious to God, how can it be all that bad? D.L. Moody died, I believe, in late December. I'm not sure the exact date, but the month 1899, the year 1899. And uh, from his deathbed, he didn't, he didn't die, you know, suddenly in a in a bad accident or something like that. He lingered for a while and then eventually died in his bed. But before he died, he dictated a sermon that would be published in newspapers all across America and around the world like most of his Sunday morning sermons were for years and years. And what he said in his sermon, he said, one day soon you're going to read in the paper that D.L. Moody is dead. He said, don't you believe it? He said, the morning that you wake up and read that D.L. Moody is dead, he said, D.L. Moody will be more alive than he ever has been. 
And it's going to be the same for us, folks. If you're saved, you have nothing but glory. You have nothing but eternal life and eternal peace and eternal happiness and eternal rest, eternal perfect health, eternal joy. That's all we have to look forward to. Keep your eye on the person of Jesus Christ who makes it possible that all those things are going to happen. That's going to fulfill his word. That's going to fulfill his promises. Well, I've got more to say, but let me try to figure out a place to quit here. Keep your eyes on Jesus. You know, bad things happen when you, when you get your eyes off the Lord, don't they? Peter got his eyes off the Lord and onto the storm, and he began to sink. The Lord could let him drown. Paul's one-time friend, Demas, got his eyes off the Lord and focused on this present world. And remember, Paul wrote, Demas hath forsaken me. That's a pretty strong word, isn't it? Demas hath forsaken me, Paul said, having loved this present world. David got his eyes off the Lord and onto another man's wife, and that cost him his testimony. It cost him his friends. It cost him his children. Almost cost him his kingdom. Samson got his eyes off the Lord and onto a heathen woman, and he lost his eyes. Keep your eyes on the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Keep your eyes on the place called heaven. Keep your eyes on the person of Christ. And if you'll do those three simple things, I promise you, you'll keep the fire burning. Not only for a year, two years, four years in Bible college, but right on into the, whatever the Lord has for you after college and right to the end of your life, you can be zealous of good works, which is what God saved us to anyway. You go back and read the text we started with. Keep the fire burning. Amen. Let's bow our heads together, please, and stand. Heads bowed, eye closed.